a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. We're turning our attention to another of those major anti-Christian pieces of legislation that's soon to come before our parliaments. And as you can tell, there are various pieces of legislation that affect religious freedom at both federal and state levels. Let's get a focus on developments in the state of Queensland today. Christians are in the crosshairs of the Queensland government. The proposed new anti-discrimination laws would fundamentally alter the operation of Queensland's discrimination legislation. It's drafted in response to the Human Rights Commission's recommendations and will reflect the changing understand of, understanding of that word equality. There's a goal of what they call a fair balance between competing rights. But as we've seen time and time again, Christians, families and churches are so often in the sights of lawmakers. Well, these days, fair balance usually means anti-Christian. Well, our special guest today is Emeritus Professor Patrick Parkinson, the former Dean of Law at the University of Queensland. He's a specialist in family law, child protection and law and religion. And he's been monitoring the developments in Queensland very closely. Patrick Parkinson, a special welcome along to 2020. Thank you very much, Neil. Patrick, let's just get an, uh, your opinion of what's going on in the state of Queensland, something of an overview on what the Queensland Parliament is preparing for. Uh, how do you see things as they're developing? Well, I think they are a very grim deal. Um, Queensland is proposing the most radical um, laws in the country, worse than Victoria, which has had passed laws couple of years ago, which were really discriminatory against Christians. So let me give you a little bit of a background to help people understand. We are a multicultural society, Neil, and we have people of different faiths different, and no faith at all, different cultures and values. And the way we've managed that in the past is to say, well, certain discrimination laws, for example, discrimination based on sex, there have to be exemptions for some faith groups. The Pope must be able to be Catholic and the Pope must be able to be male. These are not difficult concepts to understand. But there's been a war on these exceptions and this is happening all over the country. It's happening at federal level. A belief that you should not be able to discriminate against anybody on any basis. Um, which can include lifestyle issues. So for example, under the new Queensland laws, it will be unlawful for any Christian organization, any church, any Christian school to discriminate against somebody on the basis of sex work. That's what we used to call prostitution. And no exemptions, pretty much no exemptions are built into this draft Queensland bill. So Patrick, it's, it's very... let's, yeah. let's just sort of uh, drill a little bit deeper here. Uh, as you say, uh, the terminology as it changes, um, what we used to call prostitution, and uh, so many of us still will call it that, it's just now called sex work. But sex work takes in a whole gamut of people other than what might come to mind when we say prostitution. What do we understand here when the Queensland government is using this terminology in their proposals? Well, when we start calling things sex work, we are essentially saying it's just another form of work. Now, look, there are people engaged in prostitution, women, mostly some men, who are victims. They're victims of sex trafficking. They're victims of terrible histories of childhood abuse in their past. But for a lot of people who engage in sex work, and by that I mean also making porn movies and this sort of thing, it is a choice. And we ought to be able to not condone that choice. We ought to be able to say that is wrong. And under the Queensland's bill, believe it or not, somebody acting in a hard porn film would be protected by Queensland's laws. You couldn't sack them. 
Okay, let's just stay with this for a moment, uh, because if there's an actor and uh, they are in a porn film, uh, let's say that they're also a school teacher. Uh, how does that work uh, when you're eliminating discrimination from people who are working in sex work? Uh, how does that work? How does that look to you? I know it sounds like an absurd example, Neil, but... There is a site which some of your listeners may know of called OnlyFans. And apparently, and I haven't been there, let me assure you, women undress themselves, engage in sex talk, show their bodies for money. Now, there have been at least three cases I've come across on a quick Google search of teachers in America who have been fired because they had an OnlyFans account in which they were doing that. That's sex work in a court, in terms of the Quinton and Bill. So what happens? Well, your teacher engaged in sex, but could not be fired without um, having the right to sue you for discrimination because her sex work is lawful and the fact that it contravenes the values of the school or the church, neither here nor there. Okay, there's lots of examples. We might get into some more of those. But come back here for a moment to what is developing in Queensland, the state of Queensland. And there's lots of listeners to our conversation today listening in Queensland, as there are listeners in New South Wales and Victoria and Tasmania and South Australia and Northern Territory and WA as well and the ACT. Uh, but this is more specific for what's happening in Queensland. And I know that you've made a comparison of Stephen Miles, the Queensland Premier, uh, competing with the former Victorian Premier Dan Andrews, who had the the reputation for being the most anti-Christian Premier. Uh, is this where Stephen Miles is heading? I think he is headed into the, into the lead, um, worse than Daniel Andrews. And not just, I'm not picking out one man, I'm picking out his cabinet. The Queensland government has put through a lot of radical legislation in the last year, or two and wishes to put through more. So yes, this is an issue, but it's not an issue just for Queensland listeners. In New South Wales, there's currently a bill before the New South Wales Parliament, which does something pretty similar to the Queensland one. WA has been talking about it. So these are issues for the whole country. Uh, let's move into, uh, our, with our special guest, uh, Emeritus Professor Patrick Parkinson, uh, on what happens to the church We've been talking, even in our earlier conversation today, around what happens with criminalising Christians and criminalising clergy when these laws are changing in our states. Uh, what do we understand about what's happening in the state of Queensland with what's proposed, uh, you know, led by Queensland Premier Stephen Miles here? Uh, how are clergy, how are church leaders likely to be affected by some of the proposed changes? Well, Neil, it could just be a drafting error. This is a consultation draft. The Queensland government is still um, thinking about what its final version will be. But on the current draft, if a minister of religion, a pastor, a priest, engages in sexual misconduct, which could be adultery, it could be, as I have known, um, a minister sleeping with several women in the congregation consensually, it all comes out they would not be able to be sacked without having the right to sue the church for discrimination. Why not? Because Section 61 of the bill says, well, you can discriminate on the basis of religious belief when you are appointing, but you can't maintain your code of conduct in relation to dismissal or other disciplinary action. So this is a law which is not just going to affect Christian schools, and other Christian organisations, it's going to the very heart of the rights of churches to maintain their ethos and values, even with their clergy. Churches have, and listeners will appreciate, very high standards so far as codes of conduct go. And there may be some denominations that some might be able to identify where those codes of conduct have been watered down of recent times depending on where churches have headed here but churches that have very high standards usually it's because there's a biblical foundation 
So churches set their standards according to a biblical foundation on relationships and marriage, those sorts of things. Uh, So when you have a government that wants to water down those standards or create opportunity for people to challenge the church, that's a concern, isn't it, Patrick? It really is a very serious concern. And let me explain why my example is so. You can't discriminate on the basis of relationship status under this bill. And if a priest or a minister of religion commits adultery, he is engaging in conduct which goes to his relationship status. He's married and he's having an, uh, an, an affair. So you can see how the law is making it harder and harder for churches and other organizations, uh, Islamic organizations and others, to maintain their values and be beliefs and we have to urge the government to protect the right of religious organizations of whatever kind to maintain their values and beliefs at least in relation to their to their staff is there any scenario by which we might see that there is you know some sort of conspiracy for government control of churches uh, the very thought of governments having control and total control at that uh, some might see this as one way that governments can control the morality uh, in uh, the churches and therefore uh, across all of the electorates any thoughts here is there is there some bigger conspiracy at hand i'm not into conspiracy theories i try to avoid them like the plague but let me be clear about what is happening first of all it's not so much that the government wants control of the churches it wants to give to the courts the ultimate decision making around whether somebody's been appointed um to a school for example where it's a genuine occupational requirement that they be a person of faith so there's probably no difficulty with the school chaplain or the christian studies teacher or even the principal but the courts will then determine whether Being a Christian is a valid um, factor in any other role in the school. So essentially the government is saying to the courts, you must adjudicate on all of this. And that can be hugely disruptive. But there's another way in which the government is directly wanting to control not only every church, but every tradie, every pizza shop, every small business owner in Queensland. Let me explain why, because this is really mad. Under the proposed laws, you're not allowed to discriminate. We get that, right? So a small business can't turn away somebody who's transgender and refuse to sell them something, and nor should they be able to. But beyond that, the government is imposing upon every business, every organisation, every tradie, every church in Queensland, the duty, a positive duty to eliminate discrimination. So it's requiring all of us to engage in its work of eliminating discrimination in accordance with its social and moral values. And Steve Miles' social and moral values and my social and moral values, I'm afraid, are not the same. So, yes, the bill does actually require uh, have the government wanting all of us to walk its walk. So social and moral values uh, determined by uh, the politics of the day, uh, which is, I guess, one reason why on this program, at least, we encourage Christians to be involved in shaping the values of their community because there's a political process that helps to do that. But as you say, Patrick, it's courts who are ultimately in charge of how those values are outworked when cases are brought before the court and they're tried there. Uh, What do we do then uh, with the fact that there might be those who are sitting on the bench who are activists in their own uh, sense of uh, understanding their own values and applying those in the courts? Um, How do you see things as they're developing in the way that that will change the fabric of, of community values? Most judges are very sensible, hard-working people who have a great deal of respect for um, legal precedent and for the values enshrined in the, in the law. But they have to apply the legal law. And the test will be whether the discrimination alleged is reasonable or proportionate. That's the test in the legislation. So 
if I say that a teacher in a Christian school must be a Christian in order to apply for that job or remain in that job, the government under the Queensland Bill will, will, gives to the courts the right to say, well, is that reasonable? Is that proportionate? And can you see that that essentially gives the value judgment to the judge, not to the, not to, not to the school, not to the church? We are handing over, in a sense, the right to decide what's reasonable to a secular body, the court. So handing over uh, those biblical foundations, uh, and this is where I guess this terminology freedom of religion comes into play because we've had a wonderful experience in Australia, haven't we, of being free religiously, uh, free to be able to determine what is taught from the pulpit, but that's now being challenged and is likely to come into conflict uh, when the judge who's sitting on the bench applies a different law to what we're used to that enables freedom. So uh, in some sense here, around relationships, religious freedom is really under attack. How do you see things? There is no question that all over Australia, religious freedom is under serious attack. Every listener needs to understand that. It may be different in different states, but the same sorts of ideas and pressures are coming all over the country. And the freedoms that we have enjoyed, the freedoms to run our schools, our institutions, um, are being whittled away each, each, each year, somewhere or other in Australia. Now, it's not inevitable. We can fight back, but I must urge every listener to realize that this is happening and to be part of a movement to restore religious freedoms in these areas. Uh, let me ask you, Patrick, because we often say, where is the voice of the church when these sorts of pieces of legislation are before our parliaments? Uh, how is the church responding to these changes in the state of Queensland? Well, Neil, I have some very good news here. The churches have been united and they have been strong. So there's a group called Queensland Churches Together, which brings together uh, leaders across many different denominations. They've all signed a, sub, a, a submission to the Queensland the government, strongly protesting the way in which these laws adversely affect religious organizations and religious faith. And that's what we need to, need, need to see. It's terrific that there's been that coordination um, it's a strong submission. And if the Queensland government goes ahead with the bill in its current form, it will be taking on the entirety of the faith community, the church community in Queensland, effectively. Has this been happening in other states around Australia? To your knowledge, Patrick, has there been a combined effort from church leaders to have the voice of the church, the voice of Christians heard in the corridors of power? Is this something you've been able to keep across over these years? Well, you may remember that I um, was at one stage chair. I'm still a board member of Freedom for Faith. Freedom for Faith is an organisation which has a number of the national churches as affiliates, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, Seventh-day Adventists, the Sydney Anglicans, um, the Australian Christian churches and others. And we have tried to be for the last 10 years or so a voice in the federal parliament in particular, but also state parliaments. But we are, we are, we are small. We need to become a lot larger um, in order to be as effective as we can be in this space. But yes, we've had significant unity. And let me say, Neil, significant unity with Jewish and Islamic leaders as well on all these points. The faith community is not divided on this. We are united. And at a federal level, this has been happening as well, hasn't it? Uh, there has been a combined voice of Christian leaders, or let's just be inclusive enough to say religious leaders, because as you mentioned, that there are other religious communities that are also signing off on some of these letters because their own religious freedom is under threat as well. But uh, these things have been happening at federal level, and, uh, and there's been church leaders who've been writing to the Prime Minister uh, these letters. Now... 
I wonder whether you've got any thoughts here as to how effective those letters are and uh, even what other areas of lobbying uh, have to be uh, actually uh, exploited to be able to have the voice of the Christian church heard. Any thoughts here? So I think Mr. Albanese is genuinely wanting to get some sort of deal, some sort of bipartisan agreement on these issues. And that's very commendable. He's caught between a rock and a hard place. On one side, there are the secular left in his party, but secular people throughout the community who do not see any justification for discriminating against gay, lesbian, or transgender people or similar. And so there's that strong view. And there's the strong view that uh, faith organizations ought to be able to organize themselves according to their values. So Mr. Albanese is caught in a rock and a hard place, and he is listening, and I believe he does want to have an, a, um, a deal on this. But let me just say this, Neil, it, it has to be a national solution to this problem. We can't have the federal parliament legislating in a way which we could live with, and the Queensland parliament, or the Victorian parliament, or the Western Australian parliament, um, going to the extremes that we are seeing in the States. So. I'm calling on Mr. Albanese to take national leadership and reach a national compromise position on these issues that we can all move on and live and let live in peace. And this does mean, doesn't it, uh, that there are going to have to be exemptions for religious organisations. Otherwise, there can be no resolution. Is is this really the common idea is this the consensus here that there is no resolution apart from having some level of uh, exemption for the church when it comes to being able to conduct business as church does uh, according to the bible yes and no neil yes and no i don't want exemptions i don't want the right to discriminate i just want the right to select it's different the, the right to select Christian staff for a Christian school is not a right to discriminate against everybody else. It's just to say, this is what we're here for. This is our mission. This is our purpose. And these are the staff we need to fulfill that purpose. An environmental group has that, that, has that freedom. Um, an environmental group can select people who believe what it believes. Of course they can. But governments are now saying that Christians can't. So it's all about a level, level playing field. And I don't think it is right or wise to talk about special exemptions for people of faith. There are lesbian and gay groups who need the same freedoms that we as Christians need because they're being restricted in their freedom to have groups. So it's across the, across the board of a lot of organisations being constricted by these very, very uh, tight anti-discrimination laws which actually cause more conflict than anything else. When all of these pieces of legislation are coming before our parliaments, um, this new word that has come to light, lawfare, uh, there's ammunition, isn't there, for groups that want to uh, be antagonistic towards those religious groups. And as you say, even now, because uh, even as you highlight the divisions that are between those uh, letters LGBTQI, they don't all get along either. And so uh, freedoms are under threat everywhere. Uh, so when we're trying to deal with these things, um, does it is it the fact that, you know, the more legislation you have becoming before parliaments, the more ammunition is there for all sorts of people on every side to use against each other? That's exactly right. It exacerbates conflict rather than reduces it. Now, let me just unpack this a bit, bit, bit more, Neil. Do I believe the Commonwealth Bank should be able to discriminate against people on the basis of their sexual orientation, transgender identity, political belief, faith, or anything else? No, of course I don't. Nor the University of Sydney, <laughs> nor all these other organisations in public life. But there is a human right called freedom of association. And if I'm not engaged in public commerce, if, for example, I want to start a, a women's group just for women, not, not me, but a... a a woman wants to do that. Why shouldn't they be able to? And before the court, starting in a few days' time, is a case called Tickle versus Giggle. Most extraordinary case where 
a woman's group, which is just an app, to allow women to meet other women and to maybe find a flatmate or to go, you know, to become friends, um, is being sued by a trans female person who genuinely identifies as female and has gone through all the um, uh, steps to do that. So you see, it's a clash not only about LGBT issues, it's a clash between women's rights to have their own groups and transgender people. So we have to solve this, I think, by saying, let's allow people the freedom to live and let live. Not the Commonwealth Bank, not the University of Sydney, but private organisations, which includes churches, should be able to determine who are their members, who's allowed in and who's not with minimal constraints upon that freedom. That's where we need to get, get to. But these things are not going to go away anytime soon, are they? And is this why Christians need to be engaging more intentionally around some of these issues? They're not going away, and if you don't actually engage, um, then the rights of religious freedom, the rights to uh, freedom of association, as you point out, those things are being trampled if no one stands up and says, wait a minute, you've gone too far. It really is true. What we have to be engaged, because most of what happens is led by a tiny minority of the population. The numbers of people who are actually involved in politics, I think it's about no more than 6% of the population are really engaged in these sorts of issues. 94% are, are, are not. And so what happens is that 6% can drive particular changes to the law. 94% don't know about it until it hits them in the face. And a good example of this, of where it hit people in the face, was Leah Thomas winning the um, swimming competitions in elite swimming in universities in the... Uh, United States, suddenly people saw this photograph of this six foot four tall, obviously male looking person and on the gold uh, gold as, um, stand and next to them, the silver and the bronze, women so much shorter and so on. And I think it's instances like that which make people say, hold on a minute, but it's too late because the laws are passed and the precedents are being set. And so we do have to be in the 6%, realising these things are happening and arguing our case against them. So there'd be a good goal to turn 6% into 7%, extra ones and twos, uh, taking up a challenge to be involved in a battle for freedoms. So uh, 1-800-316-316, you might have your own contribution to make to our conversation. Uh, Patrick, let's take a call. Lawrence is on the line from Perth, WA. Hey, Lawrence, welcome along. Oh, good morning. Thank you. I suppose it's a bigger, pic uh, bigger um, picture question. Um, the Lord's Prayer says that um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. And then Proverbs 21.30 says, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. But then in Romans it says that God hands over people and society to the way it wishes to go. Uh, can you give some insight into this tension, I suppose you could call it? Uh, Patrick, put your theologian's hat on now, and uh, what are your thoughts for Lawrence? Um, I think we've been very blessed to grow up in a society where Christianity has been a cultural foundation. But there are Christians all over the world who have never enjoyed that in, in experience enormous persecution. So, and I have myself lived for nine months in uh, Czechoslovakia during the communist era, when I, I myself experienced what it was like to live in a persecuted society. And so that changes how you think about scriptures somehow all those promises are true but then they may not be true this minute this year this century um they may be true in some places and less in in others and let me give you uh from revelation if i may um an insight into this there are seven churches seven letters to the churches in revelation you'll be, be familiar with them 
And mostly when we think about those letters to the seven churches, they are condemning or criticizing the church for something or other. You are lukewarm, you are whatever. There's actually two churches who are commended. Two churches, Thyatira and there's another. In one of them, the Lord says, be faithful unto death and you will have the crown of life. And to the other, he says, because of your faithfulness, you will be spared the troubles that are to come. Two churches, both faithful, both committed to the Lord, one experiencing tri travels unto death, the other one spared the tribulation. There is the wisdom and the will and the mystery of God. Lawrence, anything more to add? Oh, no, that's a wonderful answer. Thanks for your comments. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Our talkback line open, 1-800-316-316. And just to uh, just pause and reflect for a moment, because of your faithfulness, being spared from the troubles, there's a certain sense in which we've inherited uh, wonderful Christian foundations for our nation, and it's caused us to flourish. Uh, now allowing some of those things to uh, disintegrate before our eyes uh, may lead us into a place of not flourishing. Uh, can we apply that sort of understanding to our own status in Australia, do you think? How do you, think, how do you see that, Patrick? I think we are in a time when the tide is going out on religious freedom. That's where we are. But that isn't inevitable. We can resist it to some extent. We can bring about changes. We can participate in a democratic society. The tide is definitely going out, though. And the question is how far it goes out before there is, uh, on a number of different levels, social collapse. Okay. Tide's going out. Not inevitable. Let's talk about where the front lines are of the battle right now. Can I bring you back to schools? Uh, we've been talking about schools now for uh, many years, and it appears to be that schools are a battlefront when it comes to how these sorts of attacks on freedoms and these uh, points of legislation are likely to affect um, employment status and the way people are able to discriminate or not. Uh, how do you reflect on schools being on that front line of battle, pa uh, Patrick? I think that there are an enormous range, as I'm sure you you would say, Neil, of Christian schools and Islamic schools, a few Islamic schools around the country, some of them extremely good, extremely good. Um, and there are Jewish schools as well. And there's quite a diversity there. Now, if we take the LGBT issues, most faith-based schools have no difficulty in having lesbian or, or, or gay staff, have done for years, um, as long as staff uphold the values of the school, that's all that people ask. There are schools which take a very strict view of, of these things. I don't think that that battle is winnable. I think that the, the compromise position we need to negotiate with the government, and I say again, the federal government, Mr. Albanese and his cabinet, the compromise thing we have to have is give us the freedom to employ Christian staff or preference Christian staff in our Christian schools and we'll, let, we'll leave everything else be. I think we can live with that. It's not what everybody wants, but we can live with it. But, I don't, but if we lose the freedom to employ or prefer Christian staff in Christian schools, I think Christian schools have gone sooner or later they will look like the public school next door. That could be a very disturbing thing, as uh, some listeners will be able to reflect. Let's take another call. 1-800-316-316. Kessa is on the line. Hello, Kessa. Welcome. Hi. Um, I just want to contribute on the... Um, I think it's unfair to compare the bank and the church because of the nature of their business. Um, the church nature of the business is to proclaim the word of God, the truth of the word of God, and um, you know, um, and and you know, and the bank, of course, you know, they won't discriminate on anybody because they want their profit. Um, I think it's it's a bit unfair to, uh, and to me, I'm strongly um, on the side of um, you know, should there there should be exemption uh, for uh, Christians for the. Um, Yes, for the Christians to have some exemptions 
from the law. Hey, good thoughts, Kessa. Uh, Patrick, come back to the bank. You were talking about the Commonwealth Bank, and uh, of course we wouldn't support their discriminating against anyone, but uh, your, your thoughts here for Kessa? Well, I agree with Kessa entirely, but I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that. What I'm saying is there's a big difference between the Commonwealth Bank or the university or the Westpac Bank or whoever and a church or a book club or an environmental organization, or we could multiply the, the, the examples. There are businesses which operate generally in commerce. They ought to be operating for all comers. Any university ought to be welcoming, any secular organization, university should be welcoming all comers. But you don't have a right to become a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> you must be welcomed into the Seventh-day Adventist community. You don't have a right to become a Catholic. They, I'm sure, welcome you with open arms, but you have to go through processes to become a Catholic and to uh, understand their doctrines. So an organisation which is really a group of members is very different from the Commonwealth Bank where anybody can walk in uh, from the high street, and that's the point. Okay, sir. Anything further to add there? I just... Um... I'm just like on that, you know, I think we should take into consideration the nature of the business. Um, uh, that's what I mean. You know, it's so different. It's very different. Uh, for Christians, you know, we can see the benefits of our business on all schools, on a lot of organizations, um, you know, on the village level, you know, any level of, of society. There's benefits of the nature of the business of Christians. So I think we should not um, deviate from there, and we should, uh, in our own, yeah, you know, there shouldn't be any exemption. Um, there should be exemptions from the law on other things that they are trying to, uh, yes. Okay, so you raise an actually a very important point because um, even if the law changes, and we're going to have to tie some loose ends together here, but even if the law changes, uh, there are a lot of churches that won't change because they say we don't take our cues from the government, uh, we take our cues from God, uh, from the Bible, and uh, that's what's likely to draw uh, some of the conflict uh, to the fore. Uh, perhaps a, a, a thought or two from you, uh, Patrick, as we do just bring some things together, um, we're in for a rough road ahead because as the law changes, uh, lots of churches won't change because they'll give God honour and they'll go and according to a biblical foundation, that's the way they'll continue to run things. Is, is this one of the threats coming for the future, do you think? Well, let me let me dial this down a bit. Um, there are and have been issues in schools and churches around somebody's employment where there was a conflict between the values and lifestyle of the employee and the requirements of the church or school. And mostly people are sensible, reasonable, and they will resolve those differences maybe with a redundancy or some way of saying, look, we recognize that um, you are going to be disadvantaged financially, but you can't really work in our environment. He or she recognizes that. And these issues are resolved consensually. Look, there'll be a cost, but it can be resolved. I think our biggest problem, as you highlighted earlier, Neil, is lawfare, where these laws are weaponized by activist organizations spoiling for a fight, looking for a fight, and um, targeting Christian organizations. It won't be Muslim organizations, it'll be Christian or, 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 or organizations, and trying to get um, presidents changed. And, and that's my real concern. So we're going to have to prepare for that. We're going to have to budget for it. We're going to have to accept that um, unreasonable people will use unreasonable laws to make unreasonable demands on people of faith. And we will have to try to follow the example of Jesus as best we can um, in giving them the second cloak or, or whatever it is, you know, the, um, going the second mile and so on. Kesa, thank you so much for your call. And uh, Patrick Parkinson, uh, we do have to draw uh, things to a close here. And I always like to point listeners to where they can get some more detail about uh, the battle as it is raging and uh, how they can find more detail about the things we're talking about today. And so I do want to point people to freedomforfaith.org.au freedomforfaith.org.au. You're the current chair of Freedom for Faith. 
and uh, and Patrick, uh, previous chair of the Family Law Council and president of the International Society of Family Law, uh, but to your current chair of Freedom for Faith, and you're taking very seriously the way that these developments are happening in the state of Queensland, and thank you so much for wonderful reflection on what's happening uh, as other states are going through similar processes and what might happen at a federal level too. So for listeners to connect with Patrick Parkinson, freedomforfaith.org.au. Patrick, thank you so much for taking some time to share these thoughts with listeners today on 2020. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 